back with the sponsored program uh, with a session sponsored by Merrill, um, Essential of Lifetime Management of Tower Patients Using the Normal Myval THV. So basically what we're going uh, to see is, is a new, for most of you, a new valve um, which is uh, being distributed across the globe right now. I'm going to the lectern and introduce my panel. Here we go. Can we have that slide up, please? Thank you. These are my intra conflicts. So what we want to do in the next 45 minutes, uh, and apologies for my voice, slightly viral, uh, we want to learn about the novel MyVal THV technology, key features, uh, and the uh, presumed and proven benefits uh, of this technology. We want to have a little look at Coraline, which is something quite new, uh, which enables uh, commercial alignment. And uh, we want to really dive into the uh, sizing, uh, which is again quite unique uh, for this technology. Now, we've got the team assembled here. My spokesperson is Mohamed Balgit, doesn't need any introduction. We have our discussants, Abdul Rahman Al Mugayiri from Saudi Arabia, Sondos, not yet there. Uh, Hussam Noor is on Kalipur, and we've got Fadi on the panel as well. The session flow I'll introduce the technology straight after this introduction. Fadi Isavaya will uh, show a case that was recorded, in my understanding, last week, right? So fresh uh, live case in a box. And then Mohamed Balgit will uh, give a, a glimpse of the clinical experience with the normal myomal. And we might have some time for questions and answers at the end. Mind you, we only have 45 minutes. So I'll get going. Uh, this is a Merrill sponsored session. This is Merrill Technology. Who is Merrill? Merrill uh, Cardiovascular is a large uh, cardiovascular and other, in other fields, uh, uh, active uh, technology company uh, coming out of Vapi, India. They're not only doing this valve, um, they have really brought a portfolio in, even in, in the cardiovascular field only. Um, they've got other valves, they've got stents, peripheral stents, there's a bioresorbable uh, scaffold. All of that will be displayed in the Gulf PCR uh, sponsored session uh, in, the coming two uh, in the coming days. We'll focus on the valve. Now, when they started designing that valve, they wanted to go away from the traditional multi-row cell design because that is associated with a lot of foreshortening, which makes deployment difficult. If you remember, the initial uh, self-expanding frames had nine rows. The generation one balloon expanding um, have four rows, and, and we're now looking at uh, three or two uh, rows um, in a hexagonal cell geometry. This is the MyVal uh, THV. Uh, which has, as I said, three rows, uh, hectagonal, and uh, there is uh, nickel cobalt alloy as, a, as the basic frame. Uh, the leaflets are bovine and are treated uh, with a special anti-calcium uh, treatment, and there's an external pet skirt. Um, and there is a lot of valves. We will go through the sizes in a moment, but just um, if you look at it, what this uh, design does when, it's, when the valve is crimped, it, it'll give you an interesting pattern on the x-ray, as you can see on the right uh, in this scheme, and then uh, in a moment on an x-ray. And that means you can really deploy according to valve markers. So you not only rely on the middle marker, uh, but also can uh, use these, um, these patterns uh, to deploy, like in this case, uh, at the second dense band, which gives you a 70 to 30 um, ideal deployment depth. So just, you know, comparison left uh, the first uh, self-expanding and, and the foreshortening you get in the middle, the balloon expandable. On the right-hand side, you see a typical deployment, actually, of a MyVal. Uh, hardly any foreshortening here. 
um, 20 percent as opposed to 26 to 27 percent in the other balloon expandable systems and up to 44 percent in the self-expanding. Another feature here is that there's very controlled uh, stable uh, deployment due to the dog boning of the balloon. Uh, I will show you that in a moment. So the deployment, uh, even in this phase, you can reposition the valve if you uh, intend to, if you need to. So this is, as I said, uh, unique um, for a balloon expandable valve. The what we're used to and what we measure is uh, three millimeter intervals, 20, 23, 26. That's what you're getting, what, what you're used to in clinical practice. And, and you know how often we are in between a 23 or a 26. What do we do? We calculate the oversize um, and uh, sometimes operate with plus uh, two milliliters, plus three milliliters in the balloon just to try and get it right. And now this platform uh, allows want to get it right more often by uh, having 1.5 millimeter increments. And these are not like in, in the stent platforms that you know from the coronaries, this is not the same valve crimped on different size balloons. These are individually made at that size. So you have more size options and more opportunities to get it really right for the individual uh, patient anatomy. And then on the right hand side of the spectrum, uh, here it goes to third, uh, you, you can see um, that there are two valves that again extend our armamentarium because we didn't have that before. Uh, the large one uh, goes to 32 millimeters. I'll show an example with an area of 804 square millimeters. But before that just, um, would you use intermediate sizes? This is a publication uh, that we did to look at the usage and it becomes very clear. Once you have the intermediate sizes, you will also use them. Same uh, goes for the XL sizes, the two largest um, in a global EU, Italy, Netherlands series, uh, eight to 12% usage of the bigger sizes. Uh, when you have it. This is an example, an angio example, actually quite typical of the very uh, large uh, myval. Uh, this was a patient with an annulus area of 930 square millimeter diameter of 34.4. And this was uh, myval 32 plus 5 cc. So you can extend really on the right hand uh, of the size spectrum, you can extend massively uh, the uh, patients that you can treat. Now, I told you about the na uh, system, the navigator system and uh, that, that houses the balloon um, is a um, quite neat system. It can flex back more than uh, 180, uh, more than, yeah, 180 degrees. And it uh, has the individual balloon sizes, as you can see here. And again, um, typical balloon markers, of course, uh, but uh, uh, important to see there is a proximal and a distal stopper in which the valve uh, is, is crimped. And the valve is crimped on the balloon. Uh, there is no need, no maneuver to get the valve in the right place inside the patient. I talked about the dog boning and the uh, controlled uh, implantation here. Uh, just uh, shown in, in a typical example. And then another element of the system, because it's really a system, it's not just the valve um, that is unique. There's the Python uh, sheath, which is a, a, a nice 14 French, uh, when it goes in, uh, sheath that uh, can expand and collapse, um, equal to you know, a Python uh, swallowing uh, their prey, and there's a little animation uh, of that after these. And it has been used in all these uh, different accesses, uh, carotid cable, auxiliary, transapical, and of course, transfemoral. So there's a little video there, um, just showing how the valve goes through. This python sheath dilates it up a little, and then the, the sheath itself collapses after uh, the python. 
And another unique feature here is that, of course, we don't need it normally, but if you really need to retrieve the system because you can't cross the valve, you can come back through this sheath. The crimper is nothing uh, special, but what is special is a new Coraline uh, technique, which is an attempt to uh, achieve commissural alignment by using the individual CT angiogram that you have uh, to plan your procedure and use the angle um, of the um, back commissure or basically the mid right coronary sinus, uh, which is individually different and uh, to adjust the crimped uh, valve uh, to this particular anatomy and uh, taking into account that in the majority of cases we'll see a 90 degrees, uh, 180 degrees uh, turn on the way in. Um, first series uh, achieved the commercial alignment in just above 80%. This study, uh, this uh, valve has been studied, more than 3,100 patients in different uh, studies and more than 80 publications on a broad spectrum of issues like bicuspid, pure aortic regurgitation, valve in valve on the lower hand, uh, hand here, extra large, uh, valve in valve, um, and then alignment and paravalvular leak, um, all with uh, pretty positive and impressive outcomes. So, as I said, the valve not only good in the aortic position, but also has been uh, tested as a valve in valve or valve in MAC in tricuspid position and in mitral positions. Finally, research, the bigger ones, uh, ones to, to look out for next year, because we're coming to a close of two big series. One is in Denmark, three centers that compared uh, Sapien 3 um, that compared Sapien 3 versus the MyVal in a series of 1,062 patients, uh, nearly complete. And uh, this is a study uh, of which I'm the PI, where uh, we've aimed at 761 patients uh, with a randomization between the MyVal and on the one hand the Covalve, and on the other hand the Sapien. And I'm happy to report that just last week we completed enrollment. We've got a one month endpoint, so we should actually be ready to report the results of this study at EuroPCR. And then we've got really randomized comparable data on top of what's already existing and on top of a large experience that already shows that this is new technology that is uh, really useful and uh, very relevant to have in the cath lab. On that note, I end and invite questions. Thank you very much. Ayman, go ahead. Very, uh, very interesting talk, and uh, thank you for enlightening us about this technology. I've always been uh, fascinated by it and uh, keen to see it uh, more in uh, clinical practice. But my question would be, especially the use of MyVal in large mm -hmm. annuli, any specific expertise in uh, pure AI with dilated aorta? So there, there's actually a paper out um, on, on this topic. I haven't put that in the, in the evidence here, but there's a, a paper, a series of about just about 100 patients, I think. Um, and the results are good. There was a, an aimed oversize of, of 15 to 20% in that series, if I recall correctly. Um, and the results were quite good. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in actually the, the session after this, uh, pure aortic regurgitation. Not as good as with dedicated devices, but better than what we were used to, definitely. Mm -hmm. So short answer, yes, there is experience and it's even published. Should we move? It wasn't me. Ready? Right, ready, Hardy. ready, ready for the live case. All right. So just I'm gonna do a quick presentation of the case before we move. 72 year old patient, morbidly obese, hypertension, atrial fibrillation, dyslipidemia, has min dyspnea on minimal exertion, uh, some anemia, chronic uh, kidney disease stage two, um, 
from scores perspective, uh, low risk patient. EKG, normal, QRS, norm, normal sinus rhythm, QRS of around 100, uh, nothing too dilated. This is her echo. She has some AI, calcified leaflet. You can see it here on the short axis, pretty calcified um, anatomy. Mean gradient was around 44, um, so severe AS here. We did her CT as usual. We got an area of 394 to a 400, depending on which phase you measure. LVOT area of 365, sinuses of 27, STJ of 24, average to 24.5, ascending aorta of 28 to 30. She had a coronary anomaly with the left coronary coming from the right cusp, going retroaortic between the aorta and the left atrium. Um, the coronary height were anywhere between 10 and 12, not very um, uh, elevated, and both coming from the right cusp. The three leaflets are pretty calcified with a high gradient. Our deployment angle was LEO 35, cranial zero. So the case summary is a 72-year-old lady with symptomatic severe AS. She's morbidly obese. She was surgically turned down because she's 140 kilos. Uh, she's a young patient. The consideration for this case is that she's a young patient. Which is the best valve for hemodynamics? Which size and which choice of the valve giving her age? And taking into consideration her coronary anomaly and for future planning given that she's only 72. If we look at the sizing, uh, taking the chart, if we take a 23 myval, you're going to have a 3% oversize. If you take a 24.5, you're going to have a 17% oversize. All right, so we simulated also, given that this is a young patient, we simulated having the, both the 24.5 and 23, and we'll discuss this during the case. So our plan is going to be a local anesthesia case, ultrasound guided puncture, pacing from the wire. We opted for a MyVal 23, and we're going to show coronary access after the end of the case. Let's see if this works. Hi, hi guys. Um, I'm Fadi Sawaya, and I'm here with my partner in crime, Ziad Hazal. We're here from the American University of Beirut, and we'll be, we're happy to be a part of this Gulf PCR uh, edition. Uh, as we saw, we presented the case. It's kind of a complex case in a uh, morbidly obese patient, and we had a lot of uh, decision making to, to make on this case, on the choice of the valve the size of the valve, and um, hopefully uh, this will stir some discussion. So, so obviously, Fadi, this is a, a relatively young patient who needs to have it, uh, uh, the valve uh, uh, treated with a TAVR, but then you have the two uh, main dilemmas, the challenges. Uh, Reaccess, because there is more chance for this lady to have her coronaries reaccessed later, mm -hmm. and also valve in valve. So how do you account where... Is this a choice for uh, intraannular versus supraannular? Uh, what type of valve would allow you better access in the future? Can you elaborate on that? Okay. From a hemodynamic standpoint, yeah. and as somebody who's overweight with a high BMI, a supraannular choice would be better. This would have been my first choice. But however, this so case. Supraannular, such as what? Just uh, accurate, Medtronic that will give me a better gradient. I can go for a bigger, a medium accurate, uh, 26 Medtronic. It will give me a, a better EOA, effective orifice area. And probably maybe longer durability, but we still don't have the exact data on this. But the, on the other hand, she's 72, she's young. She has relatively lowish coronaries at 12 and 13 with an anomalous left coming from the right. She has a narrow STJ of around 25. She has sinuses that are not huge of 27, 28. And given that she's 72, and I ask all her family, everybody lives in their 80s and 90s. So she's obviously gonna have another valve in the future. So if I feel that this lady is gonna have a valve and valve, a TAV and TAV in the future, a short frame as an initial choice of valve is the ideal choice for her. This way I can put another valve after not worrying about coronary obstruction or sinus sequestration. So short frame, intraannular, such as what? 
such as either an Edwards or a My Valve valve. That's really? what I will use. The balloon expandable. Yeah. Balloon expandable valve. And yes. in her, I'm not going to go for a very high. <clears throat> okay, b before we see that, I'd, I'd just like to, to, to ask what, what practice would be around the, 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 the panel. Um, so, relatively low coronary, but single coronary, young woman, probably, you know, looking at, at, at more procedures. What would you do? Short answers. What would you do? Short train balloon expandable one. As, okay. As far as yeah, balloon expandable, as it has been discussed in the life in the uh, case in the box, if we use self expandable, overhanging of the first THV might affect our future redo TAVI procedure. Okay, so we're concerned about moment what yeah. you do. Most of the younger people will go with the balloon expandable. Yeah. Same? I tried, to, I tried to convince the surgeon to take them back to surgery if <laughs> they are young. Uh -huh. Because of the age? Because you think, but I mean, morbidly obese, they, the they usually don't. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yes, the same. I prefer the balloon expandable for young people. If we implanted the valve in 21 years old, in 30, in 28, in 31, in 35, so there are certain indications in the patients who are declined from surgery or not a good surgical candidate, uh, plus this kind of patients who, who are uh, going to benefit from the balloon expandable short frame, and the durability is, is a good in all through the range of valves available. Okay. So you've got the okay balloon right. expandable for short frame. Let's go. Although an accurate could work with some coronary access in the future. Implant. I want to try to keep the top of the frame at the level of the coronaries, not higher. This way, I don't have an issue five, six, seven, eight years. If down you the have line. to implant another valve in valve, yeah. then you have room yeah. to maneuver. With so this that. is going to be my approach. We have the usual setup. I have a left radial for my pigtail. I put a micropuncture wire on my left femoral vein. This is my technique. I like to put a micropuncture wire in the vein. This way, if something happened, I directly slide a sheath and I can put a, a pacing wire. And now we're going to demonstrate live our um, ultrasound guided puncture, OK? Right. So it's, this is kind of difficult images because she's obese. But now what I can see here on the screen, we see the SFA. We see the common femoral vein or superficial femoral vein below, and we see the profonda on the side. When I go up, they meet here, okay? And if you look, it's a very deep uh, vessel because honestly, her thighs are, 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 are huge. So hopefully we're gonna try to do a safe puncture. And um... okay, here we got it. So you do it all with ultrasound guided. Everything ultrasound guided. But, but, and then you verify later with fluoroscopy. Yes, like I verify now. my position not to be above the femoral head, OK? Yeah. Here I'm low, but I know this is the common femoral, OK? Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it because on the top, she has a huge belly. I'm going to accept yeah. this kind of puncture only for this patient. Exactly. Otherwise, you'll be sticking. If you want to stick higher, you'd be sticking through, through a lot of fat. I'm going to be sticking the belly, yes. Yeah. So here is an ejection showing that I'm above the bifurcation, has a low bifurcation. So this is going to be my... So in terms of the valve, Fadi, uh, we have a, uh, an area of about 400. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so what size are we going to go with? Okay, so I had the cho choice to decide between a 23 my valve and a 24.5 my valve. A 23 MyVal is going to give me around 3 to 4% over thighs. However, the, N the LVOT is narrow, so I'm going to have at least 15% over thighs at the level of the LVOT. Yeah. It's a tapering anatomy, and it's going to give me more room around the STJ and more room around the sinuses. If I take a 24.5, which is probably better for hemodynamics, but it's going to be around 18% over thighs and more than 20 on the LVOT, and it's going to make my life more difficult in case I do a tab and tab down the line. Okay, so in this case, I decided to go for little oversize in order to be able to be able to do another valve in the future. And then, angles. yeah. So one question I have for you regarding the pacing. This is going to be a balloon expandable valve where pacing is very important, mm -hmm. more important than when we deploy a self-expanding valve. Mm -hmm. And yet, 
you don't have a pacemaker in there. You, I, I know you said you you can have an a quick access to a to a pacemaker, but we're going to yeah, pace my, over the wire. Yeah, my so experience when, with yes. the pacing from the wire has been good so far. We don't have any issues, but I'm going to test it. I'm going to make sure that is that stable. my pacing is good. Yes. If I feel my pacing is not stable, I'm not going to deploy. I'm going to put in a pacer, but this is a really uh, a rare occurrence. Yeah. Okay. If somebody has a right bundle, for example, I I'm not going to. So here we see our gradients. We have at least a peak to peak of 50. Aortic of 140 and the LV of 211. So that's a pretty severe uh, aortic stenosis. Okay. And we look at our diastolic disease. Our diastolic is around 70. Yeah, and, and we our keep LVDP our eye on around it. seven. Yeah, this is important to know as a baseline. We keep our eye on it after deploy. You see how the it's very interesting how the the left main is going behind the aorta between the aorta Retro and the aortic, LA. Yeah. And that's another reason why not to oversize a lot because you can actually compress the coronaries yeah. uh, with the valve. So it's very important. I'm gonna try to put the top of the my valve just where the left coronary is coming out. Okay, yeah. not higher than it. Okay, so now we're going to go with the Python sheet. What do you like about the Python? Yeah, can you see this? You see the expansion? Uh, I'm not yeah, sure the if seams you see here. The seam right here, how where it expands. Okay. Okay. So the is you're going to hold <laughs> the wire, and I'm going to go in. It went smoothly. Hold it from here, please. All right. Put please. Facing 180. 180. Okay, we have good capture. Ziad, go up with the balloon, please. Okay, perfect. And balloon down. Off pacing, navigator. Nav yeah. Okay, so now I'm introducing the MyVal sheet with the navigator system. It has a wheel here for flex and anti-flex. For this 23, we have 18 cc that we need to introduce. And here the valve is at the hub with the skirt in the right direction. Ziad is gonna hold the wire well. Well, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna put any flex because there's not a lot of angulation. It's gonna go smoothly as you see. Okay. All right. And after pre dilation, we did not have any issue crossing. Okay. The body. So I'm not gonna go down. too high and I repeat, this is not, I'm not aiming for a hundred zero. Okay. Okay. Inject here. Okay. I think this is good. Okay. Let's space, uh, 200. Okay, we have adequate capture. Inject. Balloon up. Go slowly, Ziad. No worries. Go all the way. Very nice inflation. No more, Ziad. No, don't go more. Down. Down. Pacing off. There was still one CC left. Very nice and controlled inflation, Zia. This is the way we do it. You don't have to rush. You want to make sure that you have adequate time in case something yeah. moves. Okay. So now we're looking at the hemodynamics. Excellent. We have no gradients. Very um, good separation. The diastolic is 70 like we started. Okay. So hopefully we're not going to have any AI. Okay. Looks perfect. Excellent. Excellent. There is no leak. Position is really very good. Uh, can we change and connect the echo, please? Ziad, what do you see here? This is really trivial AI. Yeah, we I see mean, a teeny, teeny, teeny jet. Tiny little bit paravalvular, which is extremely acceptable. Um, okay. And then... We're going to take one gradient. We had no gradient on echo. So hemodynamic gradient was none. 11 yes. on echo. This is excellent for yes. a 23 valve and her yes. for body size. Yes. Uh, I'm very happy with the result. We have excellent hemodynamics. AR index is very good. We have no color at all, or trivial color on echo. We have yes. a gradient of 11. And on a, a orthogram, we see no leak. Yes. Okay. I think this is exactly what achieved what we wanted. And the top of the frame is lower than our coronary. So here we're injecting the left coronary and the right at the same time. Look wow. how beautiful. So now I know I can access them easily. Yes. I know I'm below them. Yes. This is perfect. All right. So really this is, you know, a balloon expandable here, intraannular is a perfect 
uh, uh, valve for reaccessing these type of coronaries, which would be difficult to access because of the coronary anomaly, not just the height. Perfect. So this is really perfect. Beautifully demonstrated. Okay, just give me the dilator so I can close. Can you get me lights, please, guys? Yeah. So what I'm going to do, um, I like to put the dilator in. I have my long string. I'm going to hopefully able to push it. There's a small gush, but I still haven't pushed my... All right, this looks nice. A small leak. I usually, we can do this to decide whether I add an angio seal or not. For this, I'm going to hold manual pressure. Yes. Okay. Yes. And and you ha you are below the belly fat, so... I'm going to be able to. You're going to be able to have your fellow... Actually, give me... It's fine. Just give me an angio seal because my fellow is tired. Give me an angio seal 8. Going in. So we're going with the angio seal 8. I can feel the resistance of the suture. Yeah, All right. Tight. Give me the... Yes, 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 yes. All right, guys. We have perfect closure. Thank you from on behalf of the Gulf PCR organization. Me and Dr. Gazal will see you next week. See you next Dubai. week. Yeah. Amazing. That's very good. Yeah, congratulations. That, that was very well done, very nicely demonstrated. Uh, we have time for one direct question. We might do question and answer at the end. If nobody has one, I have one. If you do the large MyVal, uh, the, the 32, it is recommended to dilate the sheath up with a dilator beforehand just to ease yes. the passage. Um, do you do that for the smaller sizes as well? I don't. I start doing it 27.5 and above. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, definitely you need to do it for the large sizes because you're going to have a lot of resistance going in. Yeah. Okay, let's move on and hear from uh, Mohamed Balgit, um, the early clinical experience in Saudi Arabia. And keep Thank asking you. questions. There are se several questions coming in which we will all answer uh, towards the end. I'll be uh, very quick here because uh, most of the slides was uh, already uh, seen. Um, the clinical experience we have, the, the program of MyVal already started in Saudi Arabia and Prince Sultan Cardiac Center in Al Hassa and at Taif in 2019. I think there's more than 100 cases already uh, deployed in Saudi Arabia with a very good uh, feedback. Uh, many centers so far involved. Uh, Andreas, he alluded about the characteristic of the valves already. And um, when we try to introduce it, because already we have in our hospital at least four platform, and to introduce this, which is from India, I had difficulty to justify to the administration. But I was lucky enough that I start having more big annulus uh, uh, patients where you will struggle a little bit with the platforms we have. And I think that was a chance for me to uh, introduce this technology. And the beauty about it, as you can see here, when you see those dense and light uh, bands here uh, with the markers where you need to uh, deploy and implant your valve precisely. And we could see this morning and this afternoon the stability of the valve in comparison with the other technology we have. As you can see here, and uh, Andreas already alluded on that, it's how you position it according to, to, to the lines. This is the dense. Uh, second dense part, this is your uh, main thing where you want to be parallel with the annulus. And most of the time it's 70-30, and we've seen this already. The beauty is the size, especially when you're stuck with a large valve, and I think we are lucky to have this technology where you have the two extra large, the 30.5 and 32.
and this is the 30.5 and 32. Even the height of the valve, it's still very reasonable. With the 32, you have 21.1 millimeter height. Uh, the first case I have is 71 years old, male patient, Saudi, little bit elderly, and I think he's more than 78, he's about 82. Uh, he's known to have diabetes and hypertension. He started to, uh, to have uh, shortness of breath and dizziness and exertion. And when we did his angiogram, he had a uh, osteal and proximal RCA disease. The echocardiogram showed a severe aortic stenosis, heavily calcified. His valve area was 0 0.75, uh, 0 0.75 centimeters square, and his mean gradient is uh, 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 44. His ejection fraction was 45, and he had very mild uh, um, AI. We discussed him in the meeting and uh, we decided to go for TAVI. And um, his uh, coronary uh, angioplasty was done a few weeks before the TAVI procedure. And as you can see here, we ended by doing only one stent. You can see still some disease, distal RCA. This is his uh, um, aortic valve uh, analysis. Uh, he had a, a tri-leaflet, but the area was uh, 684 and the perimeter was uh, 95.3, and he fits in the uh, big annulus uh, category. And I thought this is the good case to start the program, and that was about one year and uh, three months ago. And this was uh, our first case. There was some tortuosity, but the diameter of the femoral axis was good. The orthogram, as you can see here, you can see the mild AI, and his anatomy was good, and the distance from the left main and RCA to the annulus was good. Uh, we decided to pre-dilate with a 23, and um, um, after that we uh, deploy or we introduce the valve. Although it's the first case, but I think the main difference, it's a very simple, like those step uh, 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 adjusting the balloon on the, on the valve and the valve on the balloon and the uh, uh, groin, you don't have it, and the busher and dealing with the pusher, for uh, example, in the other company, you don't have it. It's one step. They crumb it for you, and they will give give you the valve, and you deal with it. The flexing, you don't need to flex uh, uh, in most of the cases unless there is a tortuous or angulated. And as you can see from the positioning, again, you have to uh, to position it well. You go with the uh, anatomy and the design, and the inflation, as Fadi mentioned, and we did see it's a very uh, the slow inflation and the stability of the valve, this is the beauty of it. And this is the final, very stable valve, you see the anatomy. And we did an echo, it was a very tiny paravalvular leak and there was, uh, uh, the gradient was almost four. Uh, this is the groin after closing with two proglide, still very good. Uh, the second case was a lady who is 60 years old. She's known to have rheumatic heart disease, diabetes mellitus. She had a, a, uh, some sort of thrombocytopenia and she's liver cirrhosis. Uh, she had a, uh, in 2000, she had or underwent a mechanical mitral valve a replacement and tricuspid uh, repair. And unfortunately, like 12 years after that, she developed more problem with her uh, a vertic valve, and she was still young at that time, and she underwent a mechanical aortic valve replacement and bioprosthetic uh, uh, um, tricuspid valve replacement for the repair with the size uh, 21. Uh, recently, in the last few months, she presented with a shortness of breath and uh, right heart failure. Um, her echo showed a severe tricuspid uh, stenosis at the bioprosthetic valve and the gradient was high for the tricuspid, and we discussed this uh, patient in the MDT meeting, and we decided to go with the uh, valve and valve, and in this case, um, uh, we, we deploy a uh, 29. We were stu struggling between 29 or a bigger. Then we uh, dilate the valve with the uh, balloon, and after that, we deploy the my valve 29, we had a good uh, alignment and a very good, uh, excellent result. Now, this patient, she was done four months ago and her gradient, uh, uh, four millimeter mercury, boast uh, uh, my valve. Thank you very much.
Excellent. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, sharing of very, very early experience, uh, but obviously quite good in experience. Uh, I think we got two on the panel, Stabd Rahman and Sundus. They did more cases than us, and they started before us a few months. So the experience with my has been, been exhilarating and nice. Like we started just around the corner and then COVID hit. So it put a hold and stop on everything for at least a year and a half. Then it started to pick up. I think there are many advantages of the system and starting with having one size sheets, which is 14 French, starting from the smaller size to the biggest size. Second of all, the, the needing it is a pre crimped as you mentioned. We can crimp it outside and you just go. Just you have to be careful, as Dr. Fadi mentioned, with the 27 and above to pre dilate the sheet multiple times to have easy accessibility. And I think there is a new generation, the Octagon, which is coming. I think it's already around the corner to come. I think maybe you have some experience with that. Yes, we do. So I think that there's another iteration, there's another variation yes. uh, on, on the market, whether that's necessarily uh, uh, different in, in terms of outcome is not clear. There were some regulatory issues that yes. led to a redesign, uh, but that's now going on in other parts of the uh, parts of the world. I think they will probably exist uh, side by side for a while. It's my yes. understanding. And I would like like maybe hear from Dr. Morelli since he's had maybe more volume than any one of us, uh, for me at least. Um, in terms of like, have you noticed with this French size any access issues like there's always been an access you know we've been we talked about this morning about alternative access have it made your life easier difficult i think Correct. Like, um, thank you for the question it's a great question but the uh, i don't think the valve is itself is different from uh, uh, the competitors it's uh, all the files they do the same function uh, and uh, uh, a good result it's sustainable, and uh, but the uh, what's unique about this uh, valve? Uh, it's uh, probably the idea is started uh, from the uh, from the middle valve is a symmetrical inflation. There is no shortening. Shortens from the uh, above uh, from our vertex side and ventricular side symmetrically, uh, and the now the ultra uh, is the same, uh, behaving the same. But the uh, the delivery system is flexible and hydro, hydrophilic. With Oroflex, uh, does not make any difference in the navigation. But what's, what makes the difference if the horizontal aorta, you need the flex to align the uh, uh, valve, uh, it's, it's good. For the, uh, from, uh, for the sheath uh, side, I think I would recommend to breed it for all the sizes because the uh, valve is, is, a high, uh, is a flexible, uh, the delivery itself, and to help facilitate and fasten the, and save the muscle for the more, more resistant uh, part. Thanks for sharing that. Um, we are quickly coming to the end of this session. There's uh, one or two questions on the uh, iPad here. The first one I can answer for the two trials. What is the hypothesis? Non-inferiority? Yes, non-inferiority. Um, and uh, the rest I think we have discussed. So it's time to wrap up unless you have yeah, the well, most quick, burning I, question I, in the I, world. Okay. I haven't used the MIRA, but one thing that uh, Muhammad uh, demonstrated there, he, he pre-dilated. Do you intentionally pre-dilate because there's no I think the jury, on? the jury, the jury is there's out no there. We had, we had a proctor with a lot of experience around uh, who says uh, he pre-dilates in about 40%, yeah. but that's just a choice. We would normally pre-dilate if there is a high calcium score. Uh, Does the lack of a pusher make advancing it no. through the no? Okay. No, I, th I think it's it's getting used to the te technology more than anything else. Okay, um, so I can see there is interest. We had an interesting session. Um, we uh, uh, shared some early experience, uh, some more, some less. This is going at different speeds, uh, but I think what we're looking at is a, is a is a sophisticated device with some unique uh, um, points uh, to consider and something we definitely will see in clinical practice uh, in the future. And I think next year round, we'll probably uh, be talking more experience and, and see it in, in cases. What we definitely will have uh, next year this time is randomized data to compare it with standard systems. And I think that will underline the value of this system. Well, let's hope that's what the trial will show, but I'm pretty certain it will be good. All right. I thank the speakers. I thank the panel.
Thank you. And I uh, thank the audience for being with us here.